Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man. Right? A way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. God. If you're a high achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com fill out an application and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done. Yo, welcome back to another Yo Elliot, Elliot Hulse podcast. And today we have our first married couple guest as well as our first um, virtual guests on the Elliot Hulse show. And so Tim and Stephanie Gordon, Tim, you might remember from our uh, Friday C Mass shows, Catholic Masculinity. And uh, he's also the author of The Case for Patriarchy, a book I've referenced a number of times in my videos and highly suggest all men read, particularly those who are wanting to head families. And uh, his wife has also written a book. So this is such an amazing thing. She wrote a book that supports uh, a lot of what Tim describes in The Case of Patriarchy from the wives' perspective, which I think is so important, especially for my audience. Uh, named Ask Your Husband. So thank you, uh, Gordons, for joining us. Thanks for having us. <laughs> yeah, we're glad to be here with you, bro. <laughs> yeah, this is awesome. And so, you know, there's so much confusion about relationships today, and um, it seems as if marriage is not working out for most people. Divorce rates are pretty high. People are getting married less. Um, but there's also teachings that come from the church on how to have a well-ordered marriage. Uh, would you guys be willing to dive into what are some of the teachings that would support us in having well-ordered marriages today? Maybe things that we can go back to that we've lost in our culture. Of course, for starters, you, know, you begin at the beginning, like Tolkien says, like Bilbo Baggins says, and the beginning proposition is just for Christians to note, Protestants are on the average better than Catholics, that there is a set of teachings and right. that even among Christians, Catholics, Protestants, EOs, who are not divorced, in 98, 99% of the households, the Christian teachings on marriage are not being observed. They are, they are disordered, the relations between man and wife. And we have essentially what the, the feminists call a matriarchy. And there are well, there's no such thing as Christian marriage, right? Jesus says it was only the hard-heartedness of the Israelites that allowed, uh, that made Moses to allow it. But even in those cases where there isn't a divorce, there's a practical divorce of man from wife because the wife, who is supposed to be the submissive handmaiden of the husband, is not being that. She's actually being his taskmaster. What did, what did you want to say about that, Stevie? Yeah, I'd, st I'd like to start off by saying that I'm a convert to the, the Catholic faith. And so my, my journey, if you will, was an interesting one from really a secular mindset to where I am today. So a lot of the objections that we hear, especially from women, about just being the handmaid and, and being submissive to their husband, I, I went through that myself um, only until I really started to investigate and to really take my husband's lead on how the family should be run. Did I 
understand the absolute pure joy and freedom of being in a traditional relationship. So I think most women nowadays, they're suffering from a dissonance. They're, they're wanting to, to cherry pick, if you will, what they are comfortable with from scripture and, and the words of Christ and the words of the patriarchs. And they're finding themselves unhappy and unfulfilled because they're not going all the way and following what our religion Catholicism teaches. Stephanie, what were some of the stumbling blocks that you had to wrestle with when you came into contact with these teachings and you decided to work towards them? You know, I think for me, some of the major big issues, like the husband is the head of the family, that was easy for me. That always just seemed uh, pretty obvious. I think when we start getting into more of the trickier intimate details like the marital debt uh what 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 does the husband have the authority over like we would have these conversations early in our marriage where i'm like yes you are the head of the household but do i have to do everything you tell me are there instances when i actually don't have to follow what you tell me those sorts of conversations at first were a bit tricky because i was not formed in the faith i i was my i was raised by a, a secular feminist so a single mother. So I, I didn't understand. My mind just didn't work that way. It was only still like, until Tim really, to his credit, was very patient with me, saw that I was a, a, a good lady and I just needed kind of to be brought along a little bit. Once I just kind of laid down my arms and I just wanted to legitimately hear, OK, just tell me the truth. And, I, and I'll take a sidebar here and just say, I think most women, if their husbands just take the time to sit them down and just tell them the truth, I think most women want to know the truth. Just be honest and direct about it. And that's what Tim was for me in some of these early conversations where he was just like, listen, you got to do X, Y, and Z. And I would say, well, why is that? And then he'd show me specifically why in scripture or just, you know, through his own um, his own experience with his own parents' beautiful relationship. They have a very traditional relationship. And he'd say, this is how it works. You, we can see it right before us. That's such a blessing to have had uh, Tim share this with you. You guys, if I understand correctly, uh, have been together for quite a long time. You started dating in college. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yeah, right at the end of, of my college. And Steph was just uh, working, but I, I've known her since she was a senior in high school. I was 18 when I, when I met this guy. <laughs> yeah, really young. And you guys have seven children. We do, yes. Tim, how did you broach this topic to Stephanie in a way that, um, you know, maybe allowed her to be more receptive to these countercultural ideas? Well, there's a couple ways you could pitch the narrative. One, to relate to most guys out there that are being low key or high key cucked at pretty much every minute of every day in their household. I could pitch it more like this, uh, narrative A. We got really serious about this four, four years ago, five years ago, when we learned more of the Pauline teaching, Paul's teachings mm -hmm. in the epistles, which really was like giving, we were already totally anti-feminist, but it was like giving Superman a pair of brass knuckles, being like, wow, St. Paul and these eight or nine places in the epistles just obliterates, read guts, <laughs> any notion of feminism. And then all the patristic fathers, Thomas Aquinas, East and West uh, patristics, that is Aquinas, even the popes in the 20th century, seven of them, even John Paul II is gutting the idea of wifely work, of not having to pay the marital debt, of mutual submission, which is a total farce. So that would be that would be the way that if I were a soft spoken centrist, I would pitch it narrative A. Hey, you know, you know, we got really serious about this four years ago. So I, I'm in your boat, too, guys. But narrative B is far truer. And narrative B is neither Steph nor I, I'm a Catholic philosopher. Right. I'm working on a Ph.D. I have lots of graduate degrees in Catholic philosophy and in law. I'm not a theologian, even though I'm a Thomistic philosopher. So I don't know scripture as well as a, a PhD in biblical theology, though I know it okay. So I was really surprised at the sharpness of the tools against feminists that St. Paul equips inerrantly the reader of scripture with. And yes, I became better acquainted with it four years ago when we were starting to write our books, uh, our multiple Gordon <laughs> anti-feminism books. There are two or even three, depending on your view. <laughs> And yet, Steph and I always had a naturally, I think, just beautiful fit. I'm not saying it was perfect because it wasn't. We fought more at the beginning of marriage, like everyone that works through stuff. 
we fought more uh, when we were dating than when we were married. I still knew this is the world's best girl, most beautiful girl, the best fit for me because I dated a lot in college. And she always looked to me as a leader. We were never, she was never a leftist. I was never a leftist. Um, Churchill said, if you don't, if you're not a leftist when you're young, you don't have a heart. If you're not a right winger when you're old, you don't have a head. I always disagree. I've always been a hardcore right winger. And so is Steph. Mm -hmm. And both of us always hated screeching, uh, awful harpy feminists. But what we did come to realize as our, what is it now? Almost, almost, uh, 18 year marriage stretched to about five, four years ago. And we, we became more acquainted with St. Paul and the explicit teaching was how much feminism had crept even into our very expressly overtly anti-feminist marriage and our overtly severally anti-feminist personal worldviews, hers and mine. Feminism creeps in a lot. So it turns out that, um, I didn't, I, I could kind of soft pedal it. We were kind of learning it together as we were writing mm. these books, hers and mine. And it wasn't a huge adjustment for us. You know, narrative A, I'd say it's a huge adjustment, but we were already, she already pretty much deferred to me on most stuff. But it was like, holy cow, the wife has to defer to her husband on everything. Ephesians says mm. that the wife, uh, the wife is to the husband as the bride of Christ, the church is to Christ. And that uh, in other places in Paul's epistles, that the woman is the glory of man as man is the glory of God. She is a handmaiden and it's a beautiful task. And literally in all ways except express sin. If you tell your wife not to go to mass on Sunday, she doesn't have to listen. But all other even prudential ways that might not be the best prudence, she has to listen to you because we have been totally lied to about what gender dysphoria is mm -hmm. in the last 10 years. It began... 150 years ago with the advent of true feminism, a woman thinking that she's in any way like a man or a man thinking he's in any way like a woman. There is no egalitarianism. We're radically different. A man is the total leader. A woman's the total follower. She's totally more beautiful and totally better at being a woman. Men are totally strong. And needing strong. to be protected in the home. Yes. And needing protected reason. in the home. And men are needing their hearts protected in the home. And the woman's main job is protecting a man's heart. He protects her body. She protects her heart. That's why man is the head. Woman are the ribs. She's made from rib meat for protecting a man's heart, for tending to him. He, he protects her and he, he protects her heart too. But really, she respects him. That means protects his heart. He loves her and protects her body. And that's one of the things that we tell our six daughters is that the most important decision that they'll make in their entire life is the husband that they choose, because this is gonna be your leader for the rest of your life. And I hear all these secular feminists or even these quote unquote Christian feminists talking about how they're strong, independent women, but then they're terrible at picking men. And I'm just like, where was the smart, independent woman you claim to be when it came to the most important decision of your life, picking a good guy? And some of my detractors, they try to poke fun at, at us or our relationship to be like, listen, I have lots of faults, but the one thing I did in my life that I am the most proud of is I picked the greatest guy who I trust and I, anything he tells me to do, I know it's the right thing to do. Even if I disagree with, there's every single time in our marriage where Tim and I had, have had a disagreement about something. And he's like, I think we should do X. I think we should. And I say, I think we should do Y. He's always, he always ends up being right. I just find that out a little bit later. But I, I'm just so thankful that I picked Tim. And that is the most important thing that we tell our daughters. You have got to pick a good husband that you want to lead you. You have to trust this man to lead you for the rest of your life. When you were discerning marriage uh, with Tim, was it, you know, I have to admit for my marriage, it was by the grace of God. We didn't really know what we were doing. Um, like Tim, we had a great example in my parents uh, that gave us a model for perfect marriage. But uh, coming from a secular background, you say you had a feminist mother. Um, what were some of the things that you were conscious of when choosing Tim to be your husband and then ultimately allowing him, uh, you know, to, to take on this role as leader? What's interesting about that and the way I wrote this book is that I have an insider uh, perspective, so to speak, on how the woman ruling the household works for people. 
Um, so a lot of these these detractors of mine, these feminists, will say, oh, this works best for us. It's like, no, there has never been a marriage that I have ever seen, and I've seen a lot in my family, where the woman rules the household, that this is a happy marriage, that the family is functioning the best it could be, that the husband is feeling honored and appreciated, that the woman the woman feels honored and appreciated. What's interesting about this, and, and to answer your question, this kind of goes hand in hand, was that women usually who pick these guys who give them everything they want at first, they think that that's romance. They think that's a man respecting them and honoring them at first in the courtship. But what they find out later in marriage is that they don't respect these guys because these guys don't ever say, no, we're not going to do this. We're going to do why. And in that moment, what a woman respects is a man's leadership and his strength. And so for me, when I met Tim, the first thing that really jumped off the page to me was, wow, this guy knows who he is. He knows what he's about. He's not afraid to take the world by the horns and say, I'm going to go this way. If you're going this way, I'm going this way. And I wanted, I mean, who doesn't want to follow somebody like that? I think most women, I'm sure your wife feels the same way. It's like you marry a strong man. It's you feel legitimately sheltered and protected and you I don't have the worries a lot of these uh, feminists have where they have to make the big decisions and and do all of the big moves. I don't have to do any of that because I married a leader, a guy I can trust. I was listening to a, uh, a book review uh, by another Catholic woman on your book, and she said something that kind of uh, flipped a switch for me. I was like, wow. And she said that real female liberation is when they are free to be a wife and not have to work for a boss or to work outside of the home or to, you know, um, you know, do various things that denote strong independence. Um, so did you guys decide early on that you were going to be a full-time mom and homemaker or was that something that uh, you decided later on? I think at the very beginning, we had the notion that that was what was going to be our path eventually. But when we, when I, when I became pregnant for the first time, we were in Italy and Tim was getting a, a PhD out there and very expensive to live. So I did work, but it became very obvious very soon. Uh, I think it was uh, six months into my pregnancy, pregnancy that I was like, yeah, this isn't going to work. So I eventually did back out of that. So. Yeah. You worked, you worked all of your second trimester and by work, it was Great job. It was an amazing thing. I was, you know, a, a grad student at a pontifical university out there. Lovely, charming life out there in Rome. I started to, to pick up a buck teaching English, you know, 18 hours a week. And it was fun because you'd get sent out to the six or seven Schenker English schools, different parts of the city. It was just a lovely job. Half the time, the Italian client wouldn't show up and you get paid anyway. So I'm like, hey, Steph, you should do this with me. So we would get sent to the same school, you know, three or four hours a day before we had any kids. Um, and she picked up some extra money. It turns out that even that isn't good for the home. Then we'd get home and it would be cold, our little apartment, even though we didn't have kids. We'd but have it, to turn on the lights, get the air, like the heater on. Right. I'd have to light a candle. Right. I'd just start getting dinner ready. And it's, you know what? It's like, what man wants to come home like that. So Man wants three to come months, home. Yeah. Three, sorry, go yeah. ahead. Three months like that was enough for us to oh, realize, yeah. just stay home the last trimester. Dinner would be ready. It would be warm. She'd be smiley. I was there all day. So yeah. the house was already clean and warm and smelled good. And dinner was already on the stove whenever he got back. It just was so clear. It was so clear. Like, this is obviously better for me, more enjoyable for him. It was just so clear. Yeah. <laughs> was it a scary thing for you? You know, a lot of women are afraid to trust that their husband will be able to carry that load. Uh, and most homes are, are two working households. Um, were you afraid to give that up? Or was it something that you were willing, uh, very willing to give up? No, I'm, as a matter of fact, I was relieved. And I think most of the, the women I talked to, even some of my friends whose husbands still work, they there is something honoring. Uh, uh, I felt very honored and loved and protected when my husband took me out of the work field. And he was just like, no, I want, I, I worry about you during the day. You're walking around the city. You know, I, I, you just, I felt loved and protected and honored. And, 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 and this is the other thing. I'm not out there. One of these people saying like, Oh, being a housewife and a, and a, and a stay at home mom, or those are the hardest jobs in the world. It doesn't, that, that conversation is, I think, stupid. 
for me, it's there's a lot of times in my day that's very easy. You know, I get to sit and read. I get to, you know, do stitch. I love to embroider. I get to do the things that I like to do. And it's because my husband loves me enough that he doesn't want me out there toiling and labor and, you know, facing the world. He wants me home and protected and, and even doing things that I like to do, just kind of hanging out around my house. <laughs> the marks what do you say to people that argue that you're squandering your potential and that you could be doing something grand out right. there in the world? I say this. One of the greatest blessings in my life for my conversion, besides Tim, who introduced me to the faith, was my devotion to Our Lady. I love her so much that I want to be like her. I admire her so much. I don't think a woman has ever lived in this world that has been more respected and loved by men in general than Our Lady. And when, I, when you take a deep dive and you really look at what is it about Our Lady that people love and respect and will go to war for. It's the simple simplicity of her life, the humility, the, her following, just being a mother, being pure and, and just happy in her vocation and not needing to go out there and be the big boss babe and boss everybody around and you know be flashy and all of that. That's what I would say to those women. I'd be like, I, you have your priorities totally out of whack. The most beloved woman in the history of the world was an unwed, what, 16-year-old mother? I mean, that's, and I, and I, I, she was uneducated. I mean, that's the model. Hmm. <laughs> the model for hard things in life is always this. It's simple, but it's not easy. It's like climbing Everest. It's simple, conceptually. It's a unitary right. concept. Mm -hmm. It's not easy to do. The model for being a great woman, even being a great man, but especially being a great woman is simple, but not easy. It is be the world's best, be as good as you can be. Handmaiden, the one that is like buttoning her husband up for war, for the kinds of wars he has to go to, that's looking, that's just loving and dedicated. And it is a beautiful job. And by the way, I'm not just saying it back. There's only one decision in my life that I'm truly proud of. There are things that I've accomplished that I'm proud of, but there's only one decision that I'm proud of. It's marrying my wife. Protestants will hit you with, yo, a career is like a wife. You're committing to it for life. That's nonsense. I've been a landman. I've been a, an attorney. I, I've been a college professor. I've been a high school teacher. I've been a writer. I've been a podcaster. You can change your career on a whim if you need to and if you're talented that's easy peasy what you can't change is if you're dating a heinous harpy or if you're dating someone mediocre find someone women and men both find someone who's dynamite that lights you up that blows your hair back and is the most virtuous opposite sex person you can find and just thrills you and you will love your life. Nothing else matters aside from, of course, you know, live in the sacraments and all that, but nothing day-to-day -day matters aside from find a great spouse and do exactly what the church tells you to. Men, defend your wives jealously. Don't want them around any, I wouldn't want Steph around men eight other hours of the day. Men with beautiful wives shouldn't. The men are pining after them. It creates sexual tension in the workplace. Women, the man lets you sleep in, lets you do what you need to do, protects you, love him, aid him any way you can. Rub his back, rub his shoulders, love each other. It's a short life. It's beautiful. Marriage is beautiful and when it's well-ordered. But one out of 100 couples are doing it. I also laugh at and find so interesting in my own uh, perspective is that all this talk about jobs, like I see, I meet a lot of women yeah. out there who want to brag about their stupid, boring jobs. And I say that across the board. I don't care how, how awesome you think your job is. It's boring. It's stupid. It's I, bullshit. I, even if you're quote unquote <laughs> helping people, the people you really need to help the most are the people that you created with your husband <laughs> in your house. And there's nothing I will be proud. I mean, let's say tomorrow I could snap my fingers and I was like the most world renowned brain surgeon or whatever these people think is like super awesome or whatever. I, there is nothing in my in my life on the, at the end of my years when I'm laying in my deathbed that I'm going to be more proud of more proud of than that the fact that I spent my life serving my family, my husband, and I was there for every 
moment of my children's lives and and all their milestones that I don't care how I don't care about a stupid job. I think it's boring. Most people, when they talk about their jobs, I'm like oh, glazing over and thinking about like items I'd like to purchase anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a hellish topic, even when men are talking about it. It gets extra gender dysphoric when you have to sit at a dinner party and listen to some woman talk about her job. It's disordered in oh, a number of ways. It's brutal. <laughs> Do you think that uh, there's an objective right way for a woman to be and that maybe maybe this is just your opinion and that works for you what do you say to women that are like that say well that's not that that won't work for me that, that that's not the right way for me i get me. that a lot um I, i'll say this when i first converted to the faith i i kind of felt a little self-conscious because i didn't know most of the women the, they're beautiful catholic women i'm not i'm not um uh, downplaying their their personalities or anything, but most of the women that I had at that time as a role model were were definitely more like quieter types, very more reserved. And I wasn't, I'm not like that at all. So I even thought for myself, like, <laughs> do I belong here? <laughs> I like a good laugh. I, but we like to play video games together. You know, I'm 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 kind of loud. You know, not try not to be obnoxiously loud, but you know, I'm just kind of don't fit in that way. So I felt that way myself, and I'm like, you know what? There was room for all in that department. Um, yeah, I and and women I've known who've said, "Oh, I don't know if this would be good for me. I don't know if I'd like to be home all day." I I'm, I happen to love that. That's something an interest of mine. I love being home. I love beautifying the home. I love learning new skills. Um, I get so this good. question a lot that we're like, "Oh, I don't have kids yet. Learn to do sewing. L learn." Uh, a new Gardening. language, garden, read on your faith. I didn't have any instruction on the faith. I learned a bunch of stuff just reading books, that sort of Steph thing. Steph just picked up the Bible and was like, I've never read the whole Bible. I'm going to start reading Make the Bible for this Lent. Yeah, I, I, yeah it's I, interesting. My wife has become a much better Bible reader than me since uh, coming into the faith. I mean, yeah. she spends a lot of time reading the catechism and studying the Bible as well. Me too, brother. I mean, dude, remember the first day of summer versus the first day of school? First day of summer, I'm thrilled. I'm always on the verge of tears the last day of summer, you know, throughout grade school and middle school, even into high school. It's just the worst day of the year is the last day of summer. Oh, it's devastating. The losers that I want to throw a beat down to, you get to the first day of school and they're like, I had nothing to do. I'm like, these are the kinds of losers that say, what do you do at home all day? Like, Steph's like... Like Ace Ventura, sucking in air. Okay, you ready for the catalog? Whatever I want. Reading, that sounds gardening, horrible. taking a nap, <laughs> sleeping in, learning new recipes, <laughs> cooking, baking, taking up new hobbies. She just got into reading the Bible. She'll read the whole thing fast. She read Lord of the Rings back to back in Italy because she loved it so much. Writing, journaling, uh, stitchery, crafting. embroidery, crafting. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Or were you one of these losers that had nothing to do? That is a cope for the women who are being farmed out by their men pimped out, farmed out, whatever you want to call it, to be some other man's handmaiden, her boss, they're having to cope and say, what would you do at home on summer? I, you know what they'd always say first day of school back? They'd be like, well, I like to see my friends. I like to see my friends too. I don't like seeing all these other assholes that I have to see <laughs> called my teachers and these people. I could hang out with my friends away from school. And a lot of these women too, they'll, they'll ask me like, oh, I just could never stay at home uh, during the day. I just, I don't like cleaning toilets. I'm like, do you think, do you, do I, do I appear like I love like just getting down and like scrubbing a toilet, but I'd also point the finger back at them and be like, you don't love every aspect of your day-to-day -day job. Like I'm always hearing people complaining about their stupid jobs all day long. And it's mostly women like, oh, I'm so sick of so-and-so. I'm so sick of this. It's like, yes, there's the day-to-day -day sacrifices that we all have to do as, as, as housewives that, you know, the other side always wants to point to and say, oh, that would be horrible. That would be brutal having to be home all day. And yeah, okay, if you're one of those women that doesn't particularly like being home during the day, then make it as good as you can. I mean, you, you can't tell me you don't, like, you don't have hobbies and things you like to do. Just do those around the house all day long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you guys homeschool your kids, correct? Yes, yeah. And so uh, would you be willing to run through the ages of your seven children. Sure. Tim, you're so much better at that. <laughs> so Abby, <laughs> Abby, who was born with major uh, brain issues, neurological issues, are, is, was our first. When we were out there in Italy, that's a horrifying tale on its own. She's coming up to 15, which is a mind job. Um, uh, Olivia Magdalene is our next one, who's about to turn 12. The twins are Charlotte and Peregrine, 
our, our sweet little twins. They're Charmy eight, and Pip. eight and a half. Yeah, we call them Charmy and Pip. Uh, Gabriel is the one boy, Gabriel Ambrose. Mm -hmm. He's five. Then we have Miriam Josephine, who's our little chicken nugget. And she's three <laughs> years old. And then, of course, we have Penelope Pius, who is nine months old next week. And so how do you go about uh, homeschooling all those kids? I will say this. And I'm, by the way, folks, I, because we're such big endorsers of homeschool, let me just give this, I'll, I'll get to the specific question. How do we homeschool all of them? But I just want to give this plug. At timothyjgordon.com, we have, I think, the best and most comprehensive tools and even modular classes for homeschoolers out there. Too many homeschoolers nice. schoolers get sold on the propaganda of curriculum. Curricula were developed by communist John Dewey at the University of Chicago. Classical mm. education is no curriculum. So for those who need it because they're psychologically dependent, we're going to show you how to make your own curriculum or a no curriculum curriculum. That class will be beginning next week. And um, by the way, for working mothers, I have this, the statistics in this book here, which basically substantiate the claim that all of the mother's income, 80% of it go toward childcare, car care, car costs, gas, and mm. the opportunity cost. Almost all of it's eaten up. So it's a pure communist fantasy to do two things, get women out of the home and then get children into the schools earlier and earlier. Kindergarten was a, a, a communist pipe dream that they made into a reality to get kids into the government schools one year earlier. Preschool is continuing this. They're now telling mothers, your kids won't be socialized unless they get into schools at age two. It's the exact opposite. Like right. the communists and socialists always preach the anti doctrine, the anti-gospel, the exact opposite of what a human being needs. A human being needs to be around their parents, if only one parent, their mother, until they are quite old. So here's the good news. Here's how we homeschool the seven kids. And I've taken over more of it as the, the kids stretched into middle school, our eldest. And socialization is not a problem with homeschool kids if you have a lot of kids. No. Like, like we do. You just, you, it's called family. Socialization is a problem. There's too much socialization in our homeschool. We need right. to like separate them. Socializing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Our kids are hang out with adults. People are like, what? This is like talking to a 20-year-old when you talk to Maggie, who's about to turn 12. Yeah. But here's what you do. It's about an hour and a half or two hours a day. And the key is, of course, you're having them do grade-specific stuff. But most of what people have been propagandized to think is school is nonsense. It's memorizing the back of a cereal box, Elliot. That's all it is. What you're doing with grade school kids is grammar, which is why in the trivium, classical education, it's called grammar school. And the first whole period is grammar. You are acquainting them with the inside and outs of diagramming sentences, the relations of subject to action verb, the relation of action verbs to direct objects, relationship of linking verbs to predicate nominatives and predicate adjectives, stuff that most people weren't given because they were educated by communists. That's all you do. You don't need a social studies class or a earth science class. That's all memorizing the back of a cereal box and it's mm. communist. So you're going through grammar, the ins and the outs, stuff that adults can acquaint themselves with. You spend about an hour a day with your kids and then you start doing a little bit of arithmetic and you can actually go at the age level or the skill level of your particular child. You don't have to be doctrinaire about it. You're already educating them if you do a bunch of grammar, a little bit of math every day. And you can be done by lunch. And you can sleep in and begin school at 9.30 and be done for an 11.30 lunch. And it I, is lovely. I always talk to my friends who are on the fence about homeschooling. And they're like, oh, I just don't know. It just seems like so much to take on. And Tim and I, we have a very relaxed view of even schedules in general. And that's almost been born out of necessity because for our family, like there could be a time where our daughter, eldest daughter has to have a brain surgery and we're out of commission for a month, you know, and have to go into children's hospitals. So we'll have to extend homeschooling for a month into the summer or some weeks it's like, oh, everyone's had the flu. Let's just do it later in the evening. One of the things right. I love the most about homeschooling is it, the freedom. It's an absolute, complete freedom to teach your kids what you want to teach them, to do it on your time frame, to your schedule. You can have school on Saturdays and take off Mondays. You can go through the summer and take off a month for Christmas. I mean, you can do whatever you yeah. want. But we don't want to undersell it. Yeah. With an hour and a half, two hours a day, if you spend your time on grammar and then 
when they're fourth, fifth grade, you start with Latin, real Latin, not Latin vocab lists the way they do in Catholic schools that do Latin, real Latin, speaking, writing, translating Latin, understanding the hardcore grammar that goes into knowing ancient languages, grammar and Latin, Latin and grammar. People are like, holy cow, you're like, just have a conversation with Maggie. That's what I tell them. Oh An hour and a half, two hours a day. And there, she's, she's in sixth grade. She's doing high school level classical education stuff because we know what to hone in on. So it's, it's very easy. It's very relaxed. No one has to go to bed at the crack of... Midnight. Mi no, the crack of... <laughs> what is it? Dusk? These parents... Right, and then have to get up very early. It's, uh, it's very challenging. It Nightmare. is hell. It is hell. The mom's got a job. The dad's got a job. They have no family time together, which is right. why everyone hates each other. Everyone... We grew up with the 90s view yeah, of America. We spend America, the entire day America. away from each other. Yeah. yeah they're never really around. When do you guys ever sit around with each other? It, it's been okay. such a blessing uh, to, to homeschool. And so uh, Colleen will definitely, she loves it. She was uh, resistant to it at first, but she's so happy she's doing it now. So she'll be happy to hear what you guys are saying. Uh, I want to circle back, though, to the rightly ordered uh, marriage and home. Tim, you wrote a book called The Case for Patriarchy. Uh, amazing book. And in it, you use a term I've never heard before, which was the household patriarchy. Um, given that that's a word that uh, has so many negative associations today, you know, the feminists want to smash the patriarchy and it's sort of seen as a, an oppressive regime. Um, what exactly is patriarchy and why do you uh, vie for a household patriarchy of all things? What is that? Again, two ways to answer this. Yeah, you know, our, our mutual friend, our C-mask homeboy, Will, will point out that the etymology of the term unlocks it. It means power to fathers, the power of fathers over their household. Like, I am not, this, some of the, some of the red pill community doesn't like this because they want all men to have power over all women. I don't do that. Mm. When I'm dealing with your very nice, lovely wife or Will's very nice, lovely wife, I don't, oh, I, I mean, I, not that I'm rude to my wife, but I don't even ask anything. I don't, I try to be not an imposition if I visit you at your house. My wife, I'm polite to, but I'll say, hey, could I have a, a sandwich now, please? Could I, could you, could you bake this dessert tonight? I don't do that with anyone but this lovely lady here because I only have power over my own wife and kids. And you should still always say please and thank you guys, but, but most people know that. It is not one man's power over everyone. The other answer that the more Gordon esque answer, that's Wells is um, patriarchy is Christianity. When feminists and other uh, ilk of, of the leftist variety say they hate the patriarchy, they're being very honest because they're satanic. And, and feminism and the other forms of subversive leftism born of the 19th and 20th century, mainly socialism, uh, international social, socialism, national, they hate Christianity. So they're Christianity is a bifurcated patriarchy. It goes like this. You got the, the higher patriarchy is the, the clergy, the clerical patriarchy. It's an all-male episcopate and presbyterate, bishops and priests. Must be all-male. That's dogma. Can't change. They are like Christ to the church. The bishop of Rome is the head one, but they're all patriarchs to their own mini churches, if we're talking about just pastor, mm -hmm. priests. Then the lower patriarchy down here below is each individual household. And each head of each household is a little Christ. Uh, even John Paul II, not known as a pro-patriarchy guy, was. He says it's the ecclesiola, the household, the, the church in miniature, the household church. And each man is like Christ to the bridegroom, uh, the bridegroom to the bride of the church, which is his wife and through her, the kids. And he's in charge of all things that don't lead them into sin. So why is that a good thing? It's a good thing the same way, Elliot, that, that using a hammer to hammer in nails is well-ordered, beautiful, and natural, <laughs> and using a wrench to, uh, you know, wrench things in, <laughs> to, you know, to, to use a wrench, or a screwdriver to screwdrive things is. And going off of the patriarchy is ugly and tumultuous and disordered in the same way that using a wrench as a hammer or a hammer as a wrench is. Mm -hmm. It is well-ordered insofar as God created man to be the head of woman 
and woman to help man, man to love his wife, wife to respect her husband, as you're always saying. And when this, ha- and she loves him too, but she shows her love through submission. He shows his love through kingly, self-sacrificial uh, uh, dominion. It's beautiful. It's just a blessed life. I mean, not to be crass about it, but in our little priestliness, we're household priests, you and I, Elliot, we don't have to be celibate to be chaste, right? We have to be chaste, but we don't have to be celibate. Our parish priests have to be celibate to be chaste. We get that bonus activity, you know, procreation, procreative marital love that everybody's after. It's very fun. And it's a big topic, and it's a lovely life when the man uh, is submitted to by the wife, but he he serves her as a king serves his wife without without any kind of notions of egalitarianism to muddle it. What do you say to men who are listening to you and they're nodding their head? They're saying, "Yeah, that that sounds about right," um, but my marriage has been disordered from the beginning. Um, how do I go about uh, proposing this idea or straightening things out in my marriage in my home so that we can, you know, approach it from this righteous patriarchal way? I have some friends that ask me this, and what I can say is, if you're 18 years in the can and you try to make this change, you ought to be able to do it. Though I can't guarantee it. Uh, the con- I'll, I'll, I'll model what the conversation should go like. It's really fast. There's, this isn't a 100% guarantee. The spirit of Lilith, the spirit of Eve, the defiant spirit might have settled and hardened so long that it might be a big battle or a losing battle. But for most men, I think you can turn it around. The, even if it's a losing battle, ultimately, it's your duty to have the conversation and to play your role as, hey, I'm the leader. I'm going to be the leader. I'm going to be the king. If you choose not to follow, that's your salvation that you're jeopardizing, but I'm going to be a king to you and the kids. And here's how it goes. So the way to initiate this conversation for 99 out of 100 of your male listeners out there right now who are married, because 99 out of 100 of you are not doing this, is listen, big change coming. I love you more than anyone. You are number one for me, aside from the Holy Trinity. You are my number one. I would do anything for you, and we are on the wrong path. I have not been your leader. And we are not even leading a Christian, a truly Christian vocation. It, trust me, this is the most important moment that we've had since our marriage. And I got us off on the wrong foot and that's on me. But no more. I'm going to be your leader. You will thank me. It will be amazing. Our life right now is not good. It's disordered. Even in, in some ways you probably are thinking of, Miss Wife Lady, in some ways you're not even realizing because you're swimming in murky water and you can't see till you get out. But some of the ways you know, I'm going to rectify the ways you know and the ways you don't know. Our lives are going to improve tenfold. You're going to have to follow me though. That's the first step. It's also the second step and the 10th step and the 101st step. You're going to have to follow me. We're And I'm going to show you the scripture that there is no way to be any kind of feminist. I'm going to show you the scripture, the magisterial teaching, the papal teachings, doesn't matter whether you're a Catholic or a Protestant. There is no Christian version of feminism. And I have listened to these this couple, Tim and Steph, and this is very doable and we will be very happy. And if you get our books, Case for Patriarchy and Ask Your Husband, it substantiates all this. So if you have a Christian wife of any sort and she just doesn't know because everyone's been indoctrinated, we've been lied to, that there can be a kind of Christian feminism, these books will obliterate that. And then there's a a quite simple but not easy path to get going there. Did you have anything to add to that? No, I think that's great. And I would say to the women who are sitting in for that conversation, um, most of you out there have good husbands who love you and have, have shown you honor and respect. And I would say show them that in return. If you married a, a good guy and he's trying to have that conversation with you, then sit and listen to him. And I think most women, what we're attracted to in a man is his manliness. And that's why we get the unfortunate trend of women complaining about their husbands in public to their friends or even in front of their husbands, which is just uh, stop that. It's so gross when people do that. But the reason that they're doing that is because of the lack of manliness. All of those complaints usually yeah. center around, oh, my husband doesn't do this, he doesn't do that. If a man is, if your husband is trying to to, to really reclaim 
his headship and his and his manliness support him be quiet <laughs> listen to him and do everything that you can to help him on that journey because it's got to be difficult <clears throat> to sit sit you down and say hey listen we got to make some changes here and so how does a woman who's uh aware of the things that you're talking about and she accepts it as true but her husband is has abdicated his responsibility and is not living up to his masculine role. How does she go about trying to awaken that spark in him? That's so funny because I, I dedicate the last chapter of my book, The Leader Who Won't Lead, to that very topic. Because um, I think a lot of women, what they do, what they what they try to do is they try to either shame or scold or belittle a husband into compliance that will never, ever work, that will never work. What men, what I found true, men thrive on positive reinforcement. Um, I've never had that situation in my own marriage where I've had to sit down and be like, hey, you need to, you know, step up in this way and the manly way. But some friends of mine have. And what I've heard from them, which works, is if you are in that situation where your husband just doesn't really know how to lead or he refuses to or whatever it is, if you just sit him down kindly and just be and just tell him like how attractive you find, not in a belittling way, but in a very encouraging way to say, I, when you take um, charge of the household finances, for example, and you know, I don't have to mess with that. It's so attractive. I really appreciate that. It's, it really is um, something I find, you know, alluring in your personality, those sorts of things. If women use their, their feminine gifts for, for, for good and not evil in this way, they can get much better results than the typical, Oh, my husband is such an idiot. Or oh, why doesn't oh. he do this? Or you should hear Steph when there's a commercial on, or even I'm sorry to say some Catholic podcasts on. Many of them, where it's a husband and wife, and the wife is doing the worldly thing of running down her husband. She can't bear it. It's like oh. she can't bear it in her soul. She is the Catholic Clarence Thomas of women, right? <laughs> She's like in in what what they would call a, a you know a you Tom of women because yeah. she's just like men are getting beaten up on and it's Everywhere. it's objectionable she is the catholic clarence thomas of women listen to how okay. she opens her last chapter uh, really fast it's called the leader who won't lead throughout the many burden laying chapters of this book many female readers probably ask themselves do i really have to submit to a husband who isn't fulfilling his vocation the quick answer is yes though it needs some serious unpacking and careful clarification these same women often follow up with the natural question then what can I do to fix my husband? Doubtless, the state of bondedness to a captain who is deficient in some serious manner or another is a non-negligible problem. The plain, if not easy answer, is that you cannot, under your own power, fix him, and nagging him to change will only worsen your situation and his. In a desperate context, in a disparate context, the toxic historic influence of feminism swindled women into believing they can take matters into their own hands and shame their husbands into compliance. How utterly foolish in either case. However, dot, 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 I jump forward. However, there exists plenty of truly feminine practices a wife may employ to convert her wayward husband's hearts. And then she lists them, and it's really, really practical. Uh, I'm not going to read you guys the whole chapter, but the point is you can't screech at him. You can't bark at him. And I see this a lot of times if I go to a trad Catholic dinner party, uh, whereas if you go to a, you know, Novus Ordo kind of worldly dinner party, it's just a bunch of feminists, openly feminist women. They don't even pray before meals, right? Mm -hmm. But if you go to a trad Catholic dinner party where feminism still rules, but it rules covertly, not overtly, you see a lot of women kicking their husband under the table going, we should have prayer and you should lead it. But it's still women that have been acting like the priests of households for so many generations that they're still leading. You can't be a follower and be like, hey, leader, lead me. You're still being the leader, even if you're trying to be a follower. Steph shows how to give a prompt that is still followerly rather than leaderly. Yeah. And when all else fails, I always tell women to, uh, uh, especially Catholic women, like uh, pray to St. Joseph. He is the king of husbands. And you know, if you're in an unfortunate situation like that, or even uh, like constant encouragement, which usually works with men, good men, you know, if you if you're constantly encouraging them, making them their favorite dinner every time they do something that you, they they did that every time they did something that was good, you know, that sort of thing, then pray to Saint Joseph and just offer all of your worries and everything to him and see. You guys used the term earlier, marital debt. <laughs> what do you mean by that? What is that? And, and how is it uh, best played out? Boy, let me just give you some context for that. So when my book came out, 
people were very upset about the anti-feminist things that I was saying. The crown, the the the, the, the crown jewel in that tiara was <laughs> my comments on the marital debt. And mm. to this day, even a, an article today even came out about that. But I'll let Tim explain marital debt and I'll say what 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 I had to say about the, it. The <laughs> irony on that is that that this upset the feminists more than anything is that of all of the eight or nine Pauline epistles that make utterly clear that feminism is BS and that men are utterly in charge of their wives and there is no such thing as mutual submission. That term does not appear in scripture. You, you've been, you've been, uh, it's Cod's wallop. You've been lied to. Um, women have to submit to their husbands in all things. That is a direct quote from both the popes and the scripture. The ironic part about marital debt pissing off the uh, screechy harpy feminists is that it's the one aspect in all this that is mutual. Husbands cannot deny their wives. I don't know if this has ever happened. Sexual, sexual favors. And wives cannot deny their husbands sexual favors. St. Paul says it explicitly. St. Thomas says it explicitly. It is not just men making their wives have sex with them uh, on a whim. It, it, it goes the other way. A husband is not allowed to deny this either. Now, the feminists cut through the, the, the BS they know it's really a man's issue because men are typically the ones sequestering sexual favors. But it's it's an irony because it, it's the one egalitarian dimension of the marital relationship is the marital debt binds the husband too, not just the wife. A lot of the other submission demands in place by Christianity are one-sided, unilateral, just on the wives. Anyway, marital debt is every time your spouse requests sexual intercourse, it's a good thing. You get extra marital graces from it. It's called the formal act of marriage or the marital act, the central act that defines your marriage. Of course, it's gotta be open to life and it's gotta be procreative and unitive, duh, for it to be a Catholic. So unless you want kids, um, you know, in nine months, you have to have sex at a certain time of the month, use the timing method for, for grave reasons, blah, blah, blah. Everyone knows that. But it goes husband to wife, wife to husband. You are not allowed to deny them. It is a mortal sin for a husband to deny his uh, sex-seeking wife <laughs> sex, just <laughs> that this is a mortal sin. Yeah, to, to put the emphasis on it, to well, put the and, exclamation you know, point, and vice versa. Particularly, it's found in scripture, and the scripture is uh, what is in Corinthians, and it says, but because of the temptation to immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Mutual. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not rule over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not rule over his own body, but the wife does. Do not refuse one another, except perhaps by agreement for a season that you may devote yourself to prayer, but then come together again, lest Satan tempt you through the lack of self-control. And yeah. then St. Thomas has some very specific thoughts about that. But we were just merely pointing out the fact that the conjugal debt or you know the, the rights to each other exists. And people's faces melted off. <laughs> Exploded. Yeah. They, it's ironic. It's ironic because submission is unilateral. Wives have to submit to their husbands. Husbands do not have to submit to their wives. And the feminists made that bilateral, mutual submission. It's a yeah. lie. But but what's truly bilateral is marital debt, and the feminists treat it like it's unilateral. See how that works? It just it's funny to me the whole conversation surrounding that. It's like these people have never been a human person a day in their life. Do you, they realize like the God created us with the with sexuality and it's a strong desire for human beings. And if you are in a marriage and your wife is not putting out so to speak, it's like what do they think is going to happen? Yeah. It's disastrous. It's the abs it's absolutely disastrous. We get more emails, honestly, um, since marriage has become kind of our vocation. We get more emails from men who are just outright saying that their marriage has fallen to pieces because their wives reject them constantly. And to a woman's mind, I, I, a lot of the critics I get out there, they're like, what if I'm not in the mood? What if not? What, what, what if this, that, and the other thing? I always try to point this women in try to make them think of how it must feel to be a man, to be constantly rejected in the most personal way possible by the very woman that you 
honored and protected and are providing a a life for. I mean, think about it from the man's perspective, ladies. If a man is like, your husband loves you and he wants to have sex with you and you're just like, no, there's nothing more personal and more reject. I can't even imagine that the, the feeling of rejection that these men must be feeling constantly. And what's the reason? Yes, if you're in a coma, that's one thing. But if it's just because you're tired, like, oh, no. I'm tired. And they're just putting up your hand and, and you're like, nope, sorry. That's so insulting. <laughs> and it's just so disrespectful to the man that you're supposed to love and honor. It's, it's, I don't get it. Told you she's the Catholic female <laughs> clan star. <laughs> men's right. Great. Yeah. Great answer. And so you guys, uh, you got your hands full, you got seven kids, you guys are working and, uh, how do you maintain attraction in a marriage long term? You know, a lot of marriages seem to turn cold. Um, what are some of the maybe principles or practices that keep you guys attracted to one another? From my end, I always like to ask Tim what his preferences are, and I really like to abide them. So, I mean, even go so far as like, hey, do you like this type of dress? What type of shoes do you like me wearing on a date? Those sorts of things. Um, I always ask him because I care what he thinks, and I don't want to look good for anybody but him. So usually when I'm wearing something or I'm doing something, it's because I know he likes that because I really like to make him happy because he's given me such he's given me my faith he's introduced me to my faith he's given me what all these wonderful children a great life he's just an honorable man and so i want to return that by making him as happy as possible and so i think honoring preferences is certainly one of them at our age and uh, we're in our 40s um, our kids are a little bit older now so what we do is we do a weekly date <laughs> we tim takes me out every week it's usually on thursdays and we just have a nice conversation um, I honestly, like the last couple of months, I just got rid of my phone. Um, that was one of the things I did just personally, because I just, it just, it was just too much of a distraction for me, checking Instagram, those sorts of things. It's just a complete waste of time. And so I can now focus purely just around the house on Tim, on my kids, just having a nice distraction free life. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the answer is pretty much the same. Again, it's bilateral. I Try, I mean, within the confines, Elliot, of all the, there are rules, right? I'm I'm the priest. She's she's you know I'm the king of the household, priest, prophet, king. She's the handmaiden of the, the of the priest, prophet, king. But so we honor those things and we honor all the rules. But then we don't make it complicated. Mm-hmm. She asks me, "Hey, what can I do that you like? What can I wear that you like? What can I cook that you like? Do you like if I'm baking more bread in December? Because you don't, she doesn't bake so much bread in the." summer because it's hot but (laughs) it's fun to have i mean she literally asked me this and then like for valentine's day our little girls are more into it than we are it's a commercial holiday but she was like hey how about if we just go to the mall pick out an outfit for each other that each of us likes um because it keeps things spicy you know and (laughs) and i'm like yeah that same thing like it's it's not cucked at all to be like what do you like do you like um you know marge simpson liked when homer nibbled her elbow like (laughs) You got or the Mr. Plow jacket, or or where's this Mr. Plow jacket with, with no subtlety in in the uh, in the imagery involved, right? Make each other happy, go nuts on each other. I mean, like you have only look. You, there there isn't. I'm very sad about this. There isn't marriage in heaven. I think a lot of the couples out there that are ruled by feminists are happy about it, but we'll have a special relationship in heaven. John Paul II said, but uh, you're only married to each other for this life, and then you go to either heaven or hell on your own but i you only get one life where you're married make each other you know be wild over each other you know what can i do that you like what can i do for you that makes you feel so special because you're my favorite you're my number one you're my one and only i mean just that should be getting hammered home every single day man to woman woman to man leader to his his handmaiden, handmaiden to her leader. It, it should be really lovely. And it, it can be just a great time. You got to stay fit though, both of you. That's <laughs> that's a big part of this yeah. in here. You got to stay fit. Yeah. Well, we're coming up close uh, on an hour. And so I'd like to wrap up with this question uh, for both of you. So uh, I have a lot of young men that follow me and they're bought into these ideas and they're searching for a wife, you know, we put it out there, or at least I put it out there that, you know, dating is entertainment unless you're actually looking for a wife. Um, so I, I would like to ask Tim first, uh, 
what are some of the attributes or characteristics of a woman that a man should be seeking out or virtues, as you mentioned, in terms of uh, wife worthiness? And then also, Stephanie, I would love to ask you, you guys have six daughters. Um, you know, what are some of the things that maybe you teach your daughters or you would say to young women about, you know, either red flags or white flags, you know, what to look for or what to uh, turn away from in terms of, you know, marriage worthy men? You want to handle the second? I'll handle the first uh, sure, question. Yeah. I mean, look, the the marks of well ordered femaleness are receptivity, passivity. Uh, uh, men are expressive; women are receptive. Men are active; females are passive. Men should be voluble; women should be receptive to the volubility. So that doesn't mean for anybody that watches me and staff. They have to be really naturally quiet or non-silly. Steph, is, Steph likes to crack jokes. Uh, I, I love that. So that's a preference. I, I had to have a woman around that has a good sense of humor, likes to have fun, likes to do fun things. None of that diminishes the fact that ultimately she's very serious, most serious, about helping me to get our kids to heaven. But she does so even as a kind of fellow loudmouth, like I'm a loudmouth, she's kind of a fellow <laughs> loudmouth, but she does so in a way that's passive and receptive. I do so in a way that's active and expressive. It, it sounds like a subtle distinction, but it's kind of obvious. Everyone who's ever hung out with us is like, we, we get this email all the time. Mm -hmm. Like Steph seems to have a big personality, but she's so well ordered in her marriage. Like, why is that? I'm like, it came very easy to her partly because she saw a cautionary example of how bad it is the other way. But all of us have. Mm -hmm. We've all seen the cautionary hell of feminist relationships. So look for someone that floats your boat, blows your hair back. If you like really quiet girls, go get a really quiet girl. That's really easy to find one that's passive and receptive. But she should be willing to accept, hey, I'm a leader. She should be not only willing to accept it, she should be attracted mm -hmm. to your leaderliness and your manliness. I was a pretty crazy young dude. like. Steph always liked that. I was crazy, but I wasn't irresponsible. Steph always liked the combo. I was like, I like how she likes that. <laughs> we were friends when I was dating a bunch of other girls because she was dating someone else. And I liked how she liked that. Men want attention from their, their spouses. You should be getting that attention. You should be getting it for being the leader. She should be attracted to your assertiveness. That's the main thing. Everything else falls in line. And I do tell, I'm sorry to say, last comment, I do have to tell most young Catholic men that it's easier in America to go convert a Protestant chick because Catholicism has been, it's always been a $3 bill in America, number one. So Catholics are kind of weird a lot of times. You got to go convert a Protestant because number two, they just, they have this. They have so much less of the feminism, particularly the Calvinists. They're just like, ew, gross. That woman's trying to act like a dude or that man isn't being the leader. A lot of Protestants, particularly here in the South, even at the level of pop culture, they just kind of have that in the water. It's much easier to just show them their theology is wrong, but they already have the better ordered view of man-woman relations. Catholics are really, really communistized on and feminized on this. It's, it's really tough to, to tell Catholics, even at the good Catholic universities. I went and gave a talk on this at Franciscan lot of angry chicks. If I'd gone a and given a, a lot of scowls, <laughs> if I'd have gone to uh, American University or, or Doug Wilson's crowd at his uh, congregation, they would have loved me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you can you can answer. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll speak uh, to the ladies uh, what to look for here in a second. But again, I'll just I'll, I'll just real briefly, like I always tell the guys that, that write Tim that emails, you find a girl that will follow you that will that respects you enough that she's interested in hearing what you have to say and will follow you. If you have that, you can basically click off everything else after that. Yeah. Um, for the girls, I would say no cucks at any time at any place. <laughs> Stop dating guys who give you everything you want because you will not respect that guy in 15 years. At first you might think, oh, this guy is so into me. He's, you know, doing all these things to win my favor. He's agreeing with everything he's I'm saying, all that. Do break up with that guy immediately. Do not marry that guy. That guy, you will not respect him in 15 years. You'll you, be attracted to him. No. Either. 
Also, I would say this is, I do not talk about this um, much because I think that uh, a lot of the feminists, my feminist attractors really like to talk about this trad archetype male who is so misogynistic and belittling to his woman. I, I've, I've really never met a guy like that. What I'm mostly running into are these guys who just do, who are so petrified of their wives that they won't say boo to them. I've really never met a guy who's like so grinding under the heel of this poor, long suffering woman. But I would say to women who are worried about that, it's very simple. Uh, the math is very simple. You meet a guy who demands respect, but at the same time knows what Christ demands of him. And that's very easy to decipher right away because you're going to see if this guy has like a porn habit, um, you're going to, things are going to start popping up where I'm like, if this guy can't rein in himself, if this guy cannot lead himself, he cannot lead me. And so keep your eye out for those sorts of things. Um, another thing I always tell women too, is that you want to have at least one disagreement, obviously with, with the man that you're seriously considering. And you want to see how he handles that disagreement. Um, particularly if you got, if he's trying to, you know, show leadership, how he does that. Is he do, is he acting like a St. Joseph or he's like, listen, you're not going to like this, but this is really what's good for not only you, but for our marriage. Or is this somebody who's being, you know, just off the walls, crazy, uh, that, again, doesn't happen that often, but since I get the question a lot, I always try to answer to address people's concerns. But for the most part, marry a guy who follows, who who knows how to to, to lead himself respectfully, and, and that's a pretty safe bet to start with. Really good advice. I like that. Uh, you know, I reverted to the faith in my, when I turned 40, and it was when I decided to follow Christ that I really was able to even step into that role because I knew that I was being led properly. So I love that. And I love you guys. Thank you so much for taking your time to speak with me here today. You guys are a lot of fun. I think uh, Colleen and I should get together with you at some point. You guys aren't too far away. You're in the South here I with us. That. It'd be cool to, <laughs> to link up and maybe do something together. Oh, was, that'd be great. I was just saying this to Michael Hitchborn, who I interviewed on my show earlier today. I'm like, man... There's some there. There's about five or six people that I have as regular guests on my show, or me and you do CMAS together on both our channels. Mm -hmm. I just it's embarrassing to me that we've never met in person. I was saying that to Michael. I say it to you. I I feel that way. Well, I'm really proud that me and Robillard get together. It's like these are good people. I want to be able to say to my audience and their audience, and just be able to say as a proposition of truth. Yeah, we hang out. Yeah, we hang out whenever we can because I, I think it would be great to hang out with you and Colleen. I, I love you, bro. So yeah, thanks for having fun. me. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about where we can find you know your courses, books, all the cool things that you guys got going on? Well, so go to timothyjgordon.com and we have links to our books. I you know I have four books. This is Steph's book. She just put this on there, Mrs. Timothy J. Gordon, to piss off the feminists. <laughs> it's a second edition of the book. Uh, <laughs> First edition's a long story. We're not going to go into it. But uh, uh, this book created a splash. That's all I'm going to say. It still is. Still, still is creating. It's still talking about it. An article up today on the marital day. But timothyjgordon.com, you can also get our 15 or 16 courses. Mm -hmm. Starting next week, we're doing a new, that would be a 17th course on how to write your own curriculum. Some of them are just four, four week courses. Others are like a semester long. Oh, and we week. have, um, by the way, for people who are interested in, um, in the whole, bibliography and all the sources for anti-feminism found things found in like scripture and what the pope said we have like i think a 30 page document for free on his website people can just download it's called just the sources it's called just the sources it's everything that we have in our books and it's just ew, all, everything just like i think you don't 40s, have to buy the books yeah. it's literally just all the sources yeah. that substantiate everything we're saying yeah tons of bible sources tons of magisterial encyclical Tradition, the sources. patriarchs, all of it. Yeah, we, yeah. we do. Do we give it away? We give, we give it, away it away for free. Yeah. Yeah. We'll we'll mm -hmm. take if hey, if you want to give a donation. I I was just canceled on Patreon uh, two weeks ago to the day I think, and um, so we have opened up a locals page that's on. Is that on the website? Yeah. You can give. Go to donate at timothyjgordon.com. That'll go to one way to donate. You can do it monthly. Uh, I have a locals page and a. Uh, a subscribe star now instead of Patreon. We do need that, as you know, Elliot. This is we need people to to give if they uh, support the project. 
but we do try to give as much stuff away for free because it's like I know you might not have 40 bucks for two books. We give away the sources there. But subs subscribe to us. And uh, if you can, uh, donations help a lot. Amazing. Thank you. God bless you guys. And God bless you guys for watching the Elliot Hulls podcast. We'll be back next time. If you're a high achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self-sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com, fill out an application, and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done.